Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Gregory Brown, and I'm the founder of Ruby Mendicant University. Now, just to show of hands, who actually sort of knows what that is? Okay, good, most of you. <laughs> um, but anyway, what is RMU? Well, it's an online training program, and it's a specifically aimed towards intermediate developers, the kind of people who have read some books, maybe done some basic exercises, and know the basics of Ruby, and maybe help build simple programs, but haven't quite had the body of experience to call themselves professionals. And when we first started, we created this logo, which didn't originally have a meaning to it, but we added a meaning to it, which is, it's got a missing line there. Uh, and so the, the Ruby is not quite finished. And that's sort of how we viewed uh, basically everybody. I mean, in a sense, I think everyone here has a, uh, some room to improve. And that's sort of why we're here. But specifically our students, I think that they could identify with it. But our students, when seeing this logo, they liked it, but they had their own idea of what would represent them. The RMU fighting unicorns. Um, which is interesting because I thought that this program was going to be something that was valuable, but really quite dry. Um, I was sort of thinking it would be something that people would do to get up their skills and then they would just leave. But this happened before we ever even taught a course. Uh, so I was wrong. It's not just a training program, but it's also a community. And not even in the teaching sessions that we're doing, but just in the general community, we've had over 1,000 mailing list posts and 12,000 lines of IRC conversation with less than 100 students in a period of less than six months. Now, this to me was amazing because I thought that most of the reason why people were coming was just to get some training and leave. But obviously I was wrong. So why did a community form around learning? Well, if you look around the room, it's sort of obvious. We're here at a conference working together because we recognize the value of learning in a group where we can draw upon the experience of others. Now, beginning programmers don't necessarily know that. They don't know that there's so much support. So they sort of feel like this. They feel like they're carrying this burden on their own. And no matter how hard they try, they're eventually going to have to fall down and get back up and do it over again. But what our students realize is that learning is really more like this, which is that it can be fun, it can be a struggle, but it's something we can do together. So in order to do anything together or have a community, there needs to be something that everyone does in common. So you might ask, what defines our view? Well, it's our core skills course. When I first started the idea of running this program, I only wanted to have this one course. That's eventually going to change, but this is really the definition of RMU, which is it's a three-week course, and it's problem-based. It's entirely based on having people try and actually build stuff. Um, I thought that that would be a little bit more valuable because anyone who's gotten past the beginner stages knows how to read from books. They know how to Google things. Um, so they actually want to get their hands dirty, and that's sort of the, the idea. So the idea was that I could teach a course for three weeks and then take a week off. So that's why it's three weeks. There's really no other reason. Now, when I first started it, we used to meet twice a week on IRC for about an hour and a half, and I would sort of discuss the problems that we were working on and give people a lot of background. But we quickly found that with students in maybe 30 or 40 different countries, uh, and in any given session, people being in eight or 10 different time zones, that that's almost impossible to do. Uh, it meant that I was moving, scheduling things at all sorts of crazy hours for me because it was in the best interest of students and it just really didn't work out well. So, but one thing is that we have a very small class size. We only have about 15 students per class. Um, some of the courses are even smaller than that. And what this meant is that rather than doing these shuffling around of formal meeting times, what I decided to do is make myself available for a large period of time, three days a week, to just help students one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. And I found that this works a whole lot better because rather than trying to figure out what the sort of general needs of the students are, I could talk one-on-one -on -one with people and work on their specific problems. Because if something is a general need, it can be solved in other ways. I could write an article, I could make a video, but the sort of problems that you just sort of need to talk to people about when you're meeting in a live environment, 
Those are the sort of things that don't really benefit from a broadcast format. So the small class size allows us to do that. Another thing is, originally our assignments were sequential. The students had basically an individual project and then they had to do three, three assignments in order and then take a final exam. We found that that didn't work well at all. We decided instead to give them all of the materials up front and we found that that works a lot better. So people can come into the course, get a feel for what areas they think will be easy for them and possibly work on those first so that they can meet the requirements uh, and save the harder things for later. Or if they're looking for a challenge, they can work on the thing that's hardest for them and make sure that they get that done first. It gives them choice. Uh, this is something that's not typical of, say, a uh, college course, uh, in which you're given a problem, you get evaluated on that problem, you more, move on to the next one. But we found that this is closer to the model that people actually have when they're in an actual working environment. People don't say work on this one feature and then work on this one feature and then work on this one feature. And if they do, then you're working in a really bad environment. Because what happens is if you get blocked on one thing, you're sort of stuck until the next thing comes along. So this works towards promoting an environment that's more like what programmers actually need to learn in. We also do iterative evaluations. The original courses were uh, basically every assignment was pass-fail and then you could pass, you have to pass a certain amount of them to gain recognition at the end of the course. But now instead we say, okay, submit your exercises whenever you want, we'll give you a review, we'll give you some feedback, you rework on it, and then you submit it again. And this too sort of reflects, especially in the open source culture, um, the sort of thing that actually happens, which is you work on stuff, you refactor it, you clean it up, you fix your problems, and then you try again. And you just keep repeating that process until you're ready to ship something. This made a big difference. Another thing that's core to RMU is open-ended exercises. Programmers are all pretty smart people, and many of them have a math background. And a lot of times, the sort of exercises that can be given to them are things that are sort of like basically doing basic math problems in which there's one right answer. But as we all know, that's not really how our work is. We have to be responsible for coming up with interesting questions as well as getting the right answers to those questions. So our exercises are designed to make people think and have a lot of different ways to attack them. And that makes it so that a lot more discussion comes out of the course. And that means the materials can be used as a jumping point for further study. And that, I think, works really, really well. So our core skills course, which was really hard to figure out what to pick for. Because when you have beginners, you basically say, OK, they need to learn language fundamentals. And that's pretty straightforward. With experienced people, you don't really need rigid structure. Um, you can just say, oh, let's hack on this project together. And I mean, anyone who experiences the hallway track at a conference knows how that is. But the folks that are coming into our RMU, they, they have sort of specific needs, but at the same time, they have general needs as well. What they need to be is exposed to the sort of things that hackers actually need to know. So coming up with that was hard. But what I decided to do is rather than trying to make it perfect, I just picked a few <coughs> things that I know that I need to apply in my own work, and then I tried to make exercises around that. So we chose these sets of things, which is dealing with services and integration, uh, both with like web services and also like third-party software, gems and things like that. Uh, domain modeling for business logic, uh, academic principles, which is like when we're studying things like design patterns or something like that, uh, community service, which might be a little bit unexpected, but I'll talk about that a little bit later, and independent practice. How many people here have a side project that they're working on? Okay, almost everyone. And that is really the way to learn the most possible things that you possibly can about programming. So I'm gonna go through each of these and sort of give you an example of the sort of things that we're doing and what people are getting out of them. So everyone loves to be in the cloud, I guess. Um, and this is where I think it's important to expose people to things because has anyone here ever, how many people have interacted with a web service or something like that in their work? Okay, less of you than I would think, but quite a few still. And how many people have used a Ruby gem of some sort? Okay, yeah. So these are the things that aren't often covered in our basic books. Our books talk about the core language. There's some books that go over you know, all of the stuff that's out there. But you know, integration with other software is just part of what we do. So we try and do this in sort of a fun way. One of the sessions, we did Twitter bots. 
Um, and what we did is it was completely open-ended. The rules were you needed to integrate with some web service and you also needed to make something that would either uh, post to Twitter via direct messages or create a timeline. Um, and people were able to pick whatever projects. So they went and had a bunch of weird different things, like someone had a thing where you could post and get the weather from them. Um, other things got uh, RSS to Twitter feeds. There was a language translation thing, which was sort of neat. Um, there's a dictionary service, you're all shortening, and in that course, 13 more projects. The neat thing is because everyone was working in a different area, they all had something to contribute to the course that the other students weren't looking at. So they all had something to talk about. Now, this sounds like sort of vanilla, ordinary stuff. I mean, to, in order to build something like this, you normally don't need more than a page or two of code. But you'll notice as a pattern here that there's a lot of emergent lessons when people are learning together and working together. So these are the things that I didn't anticipate when I wrote the exercises, but I hoped something interesting would come up. So almost immediately, people were talking about deployment strategies for these things. Okay, well I have to monitor some service and I need to post to Twitter at a regular interval. Or I need to wait for messages and then figure out how to respond to them. How do I do that? So people are talking about things like setting up a cron job that fires off a rake task to do scheduling. Um, or maybe setting up something that just runs in a loop and then sleeps and does polling. Um, some people are even doing some crazy things where they basically like have hooks on Heroku applications to keep the application alive and then did pingbacks to that. Um, it's interesting because these are the things that people actually have to talk about in relation to these problems. Another thing is application configuration. How many people have either accidentally or on purpose checked in credentials that you shouldn't be into a Git repository? <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure that we rewrote history, but we're gonna show the RMU app, and I think I checked in like all the admin stuff to that at one point, so. Um, but the thing is, there's a difference between doing that by accident, which you can fix, and not knowing another way to do it. Um, now, obviously there's the security perspective, but there's also the perspective of, if I'm gonna build something, I shouldn't make it so that it relies on my own environment. Even, even if it's you know, a single use application, because it's just as easy to make a configuration setting. But people don't necessarily know that. So we ended up getting into a number of different things there. Um, another thing, was modular design. So people were talking, how do I break up these parts? Now, maybe they were trying to interact with the service and had some problems while they did that. And it was sort of blocking them because their code was this one big long procedure where it connects to Twitter, gets some information, connects to a service, and then does its thing, and then, you know, it's just this one big long procedure. If you start moving towards breaking up those modules so that you can work with things in isolation, you can get part of the problem done. Now, I'm just gonna go through the rest of these briefly. Testing techniques, people got into interesting things. Well, now we're dealing with external resources. So now we might actually have a reason to learn mocks instead of just learning them because it's the cool thing that the cool kids do. That sort of thing. Um, technology evaluations. There were a number of different options just for even really basic things. Um, so they all had to communicate with the service and I told them they couldn't use a pre-built gem for that. So that means that they're looking at things like open URI. They're looking at REST client. They're looking at uh, HTTP party. Um, and they're trying to have this discussion in IRC about which ones are best to use. So it's kind of interesting how much comes out of such a simple thing. And then the last thing is technical collaboration. Now this is the first experience that the students have in the class, and they're already realizing that they can make use of their experience with one another. At the time that we did this, it was when Twitter switched over to being OAuth only for all of their stuff, and I actually didn't know that, so I felt kind of bad because it made the problem much more complicated and it made a lot of documentation and resources out of date. Uh, but the students figured that out and sort of shared code with one another until they got off the ground. I thought that was really, really cool. So it's sort of amazing how much can come out of what sounds like a toy example. But when you've got a bunch of people who are motivated and want to learn together, this is what you can get. And I think all of you know this, and that's why you're here, but there's a whole world outside of this room that doesn't know that. And for them, it's sort of an enlightening experience to be involved in that sort of thing. Okay, so the thing that I like most, and people hate uh, in RMU because I think they're afraid of it. I was asking people if they wanted a heavy data modeling problem or some, something else. I can't remember exactly what it was. It was something easier. And they went with the easier thing, for sure. Um, 
But I really am interested in business logic and data modeling. You can see how much fear programmers have of business logic and requirements by the fact that we have entire frameworks designed to help us communicate with others. Um, now, those things are not necessarily a bad thing, but it's, it's clear that programmers are more comfortable when the requirements are well-defined. When they're not well-defined, it requires a lot of communication and different set of skills to be able to do it. Now, some people love that sort of stuff, but many don't. So what I try to do is give them really badly defined problems at least once per session. I give them stuff that has missing requirements. I give them stuff that is hard and, it, and something that where things sort of run into each other and then I make them unweave it. Now I'm gonna show you an example of a video and this is something that the current session is working on and you'll see exactly what I mean. Okay, so this is a game called Pressman that my friends and I made up back in high school and it originally started uh, from the question of what would happen if you played chess where everything was a queen, um, except for the king. And uh, as it turns out, that's a pretty boring game, so we removed the king, and we ended up with everything being a queen. Um, and rather than the goal being a checkmate type scenario, the goal was to um, capture everything, so just to win the game. Um, and Basically, this is what we came up with and we made some modifications along the way. So, it's a two-player game and uh, you play with uh, black and white stones and the black goes first, like you go. Um, so, the idea is that these all move like queens in chess. So, uh, you know, your options are sort of limited at first, but they can go diagonally, they can go uh, horizontally and vertically in any direction. So, if we just have uh, the stuff in the center here, you can see you can move along any of the horizontal, vertical, and all of the diagonal paths as well. Um, and they kill the same way that a queen in chess kills. Uh, so basically, if I wanted to play my first turn and I decided I wanted to kill this guy. Uh, now, the white player can go ahead and kill him, or he can do something else. It's totally up to them. Um, and you sort of go back and forth like this. But there is a twist to this game, which is suppose that this guy doesn't get killed and the player just moves somewhere else, doesn't really matter where. Um, if I can manage to get a guy into the back row, uh, what happens is that if I've got a space open in my back row, I get an extra piece. And in this way, pieces can regenerate. Um, now, of course, um, it's the moves that I'm showing here are not actually necessarily good moves for the game. Um, but the idea is you go back and forth, and because the pieces can regenerate, the game could actually go on a lot longer than if they were just killing them one for one. Um, so that's the basic idea of Preston. Um, and you, when you're playing it, strategy wise, it's sort of nice to have something like this because if this piece gets killed, then the player can immediately come over here, kill that, and then get another piece. And it sort of would cycle on uh, infinitely until it managed to kill this piece here. Um, now, let's say that we had a stone here, and this stone had just entered into here. Well, because we don't have any space available on the back, you don't get any extra pieces. Um, and this makes it so that there was at least some limitation to the amount that you could regenerate. So, uh, this game has a bunch of flaws to it. It's not really a great game, but it's an interesting one at least. And uh, I think that this pretty much covers the rules of it. You just keep doing that until one of the lawyers resigns or until they manage to kill everything. Um, and so that's pretty much it for Preston. Uh, maybe we can get a video of people actually playing it some other time, but for right now, those are the rules. So I could tell you that like 95% of people resign after the first couple moves of this game. Not really a good game. Um, now, <laughs> um, now, how many of you just by seeing that right now could just like go code it and be ready to go? Yeah. Well, let's do it. <laughs> no. um, so you can't see this. That's okay. Uh, I'm just going to show you. This is a fairly complete set of rules, and the students built these based on editing a wiki after they heard that video. And 
first they sort of used the mailing list to talk to me and sort of clarify these requirements because there's at least like three points there that weren't even in the video. They're just things that it's like, this doesn't sound right. Is there something missing? And it's like, oh yeah, there is. And there's things that were like outright wrong requirements, you know, and we went through that process. And I think that that is something that we experience all the time which is like maybe we're on the phone with a client for an hour and then we're taking notes and then we sort of have to build something and then go back and ask those questions. <coughs> so we're trying as best we can to emulate those experiences. I mean, that video that I shot was horrible. I did it in one take on purpose without making any effort of being clear. Uh, but yet the students with a little bit of back and forth got to this point. And then once they've got this, they actually have to build it and they're working on that now. Uh, so the emergent lessons here are like requirements discovery is important and it's actually a skill. Um, and some people are quite good at it and others aren't, but I find that people can get better at it if they watch someone who is experienced in this ask the right kind of questions. Uh, when you're sort of in a project and you're just, you're knee deep in it, you can make your life hell or you can make your life much better based on the kind of questions you ask and the way that you ask them. And this sort of teaches that lesson. Um, now, a thing that's interesting about this is that it sort of introduces separation of concerns. There's a lot of control code that needs to go on to implement this game, uh, but there's also a lot of business logic. Now, a lot of students are accustomed to basically writing object-oriented procedures, in a sense. So it's basically the control code and the business logic all jammed up in one. But that makes it very hard to test, and it makes it very hard to uh, look at the code and know what it's doing. So this comes up with that. Uh, because it's a larger project than the previous one, uh, you can tell pretty much right away people who know the standard project layout and those who don't. Uh, so with enough uh, complexity, you get into the reason why you might want to organize it a different way. Also, this involves data structures. A lot of people come from Rails and the data structure part of things is in at least basic applications pretty much solved for you by active record. Uh, so there's a lot of people who aren't really familiar with the idea of um, sort of making the things that, um, I don't know, it's something like what Alan Kay was talking about with like the little like individual computers, that sort of thing. Um, so this exposes them to that a tiny bit. Another thing is scope definition. This problem, um, I told them that if they can't build the whole thing in the time frame, that they could build a usable subset of it. And that sort of goes along with requirements. Uh, you can narrow down the scope and still build something useful. So for a student struggling, I could say, okay, maybe just build a generic <coughs> board and don't worry about the game logic. And that might be something that they could bite off. Um, so I think that like, these problems are really great. And this is an area that when I'm teaching, and I, I do you know, professional trainings and coachings, and I do this all new thing, and I teach and work, I feel like uh, heavy business logic modeling and requirements discovery is one of the areas that most programmers who I'd otherwise think are really good and smart struggle with. And it's just because, it's not because they're deficient in it, but because it's a different skill set. So uh, this is my favorite exercise. I'm not sure if my students agree with me on that. Um, now, academic learning. How many people here like regularly read CS papers? Good. I don't either. Um, but, but how many people have at least read some of the basics, like you know, Gang of Four or SICP or something like that? Right, so most of us do. And, and actually, um, I'd like to ask, why do you think it's valuable? Does anyone wanna, who's done that think? Well, was that, oh, common vocabulary. Yeah, that's definitely one. Anything else? Yeah, there's certain things that are sort of common and cross-cutting regardless of um, where you are. So, I mean, there's these, these common truths. Anything else? You should know the rules before you break them. <laughs> that's a really good one, um, but I don't know, I don't know how much I agree because <laughs> You should know why a rule exists before you bother learning the rule, I feel like. Um, so I think it's easier to show someone with really, really shitty code how they can clean it up than show them how to write clean code from the beginning. And um, so the reason why I said I don't know is because I think you have to do it as early as possible. Introduce those concepts as early as possible and say, okay, see how that cleaned it up? Try doing that until you know when it's okay to break the rules. Uh, so one example where I agree with you for sure is things like metaprogramming. Uh, but anyone else have a thing about academic learning and why it would be? Well, I, for me, I just want to be a better programmer. Right. So I just want to be exposed to things that I'm not familiar with. Um, okay, so how many people, oh, go ahead. Well, 
Uh, don't reinvent the wheel. Yeah, don't reinvent the wheel. I don't know. Um, how many people think that we shouldn't reinvent the wheel? <laughs> Aaron. So you've never, you've never ever done something like take an existing library and rewrite it to make your own. <laughs> no. <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> no, so that's. Well, I was. What's that? <laughs> um, so, reinventing the wheel. Well, for me, I, what I meant by that, I mean, obviously it has implications, but, you know, if it's a new concept for me, you know, it may take me a lot of code to write something that people have figured out how to write pretty simply. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, I could write, like, three pages of code to do something that Maybe well, I mean, we're talking about things like design patterns and you know, right. or, or these sort of high-level concepts. And you sort of need to get far enough into a project to realize that you need those things before you apply them. Uh, we actually do an exercise of trying to apply first, and that turns to be really, really hard. And I'll, I'll talk about that now. But the, the idea of wanting to just basically use what's already out there, I, I think there's value in it. But I think that there's also value in trying to frame things in your own level of understanding and then looking at how it compares to something else and then doing a refinement at your level of understanding. Because a lot of times, how many people, and I'll admit to this, read a design patterns book and then tried to fit as many patterns as possible into a project? I mean, that's, that's one of the things that you can run into as a risk there. So we sort of run that, we ran that as one of the, those exact exercises, which was, I told people to go out and read as many design patterns as they want, and then I told them this, that they need to pick one of them that they can think of a practical application for. And they need to write it in a way that's natural and idiomatic in Ruby. Um, now, the interesting thing about that is when you actually find that, you find the patterns almost disappear. Like, who can tell me what pattern this is? Observer. Observer, right. But as compared to the traditional definition of an observer, Ruby is so much more low ceremony because all you're doing is just capturing this block. And the existence of blocks really makes a lot of patterns really whittle down. Um, so I think this is a reasonable thing. I mean, what he did is he built this little account class that had a deposit and withdraw. Um, I just, just showing the withdraw here, but then he made some observers to create like a ledger that showed like whenever a transaction was made. Um, and he used observers to do that. This was a really interesting problem because a lot of people were coming back to me saying, I read, I made everyone pick a different pattern. Um, and they could pick whichever one they want, but a lot of people were coming back to me saying, you know, I read a bunch of patterns and a lot of these I don't think we really need in Ruby. Um, and that turns out to be true in a lot of ways. Or there's patterns that work, but only after uh, you translate them. So sometimes people would say, oh, we don't need that. And then someone else would say, well, yeah, it could be useful, but try it this way instead. Um, and I think it's really interesting to see when you're trying to apply these ideas, rather than just respecting them at first. I think there's this tendency among programmers to say, wow, some really smart person said this, therefore it must be my fault that I don't understand it, and therefore this is really good, but I can't use it somehow. And sometimes it's, yeah, it's good in its context, but it's not necessarily good for you, and if you don't understand how it'll apply in your context, maybe it doesn't. Um, and that was sort of the interesting thing with this, which is uh, we ran into these emergent lessons, which is you have to apply theory to be able to understand it. Um, you have to respect the idioms and best practices of your language, even if there's these really good cross-cutting ideas. Uh, you shouldn't necessarily use you know, someone else's hammer for your problem. Um, so also purposeful study. I mean, I sort of force people to not look at these abstract examples, but put it into something concrete. They were looking through there, trying to look for a pattern that they had to understand. They had to build something useful with it. Um, and it's also a matter of picking the right tools for the job. Um, so uh, as I was saying before, a lot of these patterns don't actually apply. And the last thing was reduction techniques. I made them build working applications <coughs> for these things. They couldn't just give me a snippet of code. But I forced them to only include the relevant parts that showcase that pattern so that these could be used as learning resources for others. And that's actually really hard for some people. Some people just <coughs> dropped an application in and didn't know what to shave to show the power. Now, this is something that applies way outside of this uh, area. It applies to uh, mainly when you're giving someone a bug report. If you can't produce a reduced example, then it's very, very hard to isolate and fix bugs. 
So that sort of popped out of here too. Now, I wanna go a little bit at a faster pace through this stuff um, because I'm gonna have uh, Jordan do a demo for us later. Um, but another thing, as I mentioned before, was community service, um, which is interesting. Uh, I mean, RMU is a free program, so it sort of makes sense that I want the students to help out with it. Uh, and it's a different social contract because in free software, it's sort of like, if you wanna see change happen, you have to get involved. But if you wanna just consume, you can. RMU students are strongly encouraged to give back. Um, and it sort of makes an intentional community. So we do this in a number of ways. It's open-ended because I don't wanna force people to do a particular kind of work. And also, they aren't absolutely required because they can skip one assignment. Some people skip this one, but most of them don't. Um, and as a result, we got like a student frequently asked questions do document, a hacking guide for how to work on the tools we're building. Uh, people have been improving the IRC uh, bot that we have. I mean, a big problem is time zone conversion, so someone hacked that in. We got tutorials, people are adding testing to the application, building puzzles that they can share with each other. It's really sort of <coughs> great stuff. And the lessons of that are that identifying community needs is actually a skill, and it's something that even like if it's not applied to community and you're talking about business, if you have a startup, knowing what your customers are gonna need before they explicitly ask for it is a real skill and it's a competitive advantage. So knowing how to do that is something that's worth knowing. Also, looking for a place to start in a big complex system is valuable too. Um, scratching an itch is something that I think a lot of us are motivated for. I mean, how many people got into programming not because of some abstract desire to learn more, but because they wanted to solve a particular problem. I think a lot of us. Um, and contributing successfully is harder than just making a contribution. Sometimes people will drop a fix into a, a bug tracker, <coughs> and they never realize that like, it breaks like everything else. Um, and we bring them through the process in a sort of gentle way, saying, oh, well, thanks for working on this, but we need to fix some things before we can actually bring this in. And we sort of bring them through in an environment that's not quite as um, intense as the free software environment can be. And also the last thing is paying it forward. Um, and I'll talk about, at the end of this talk, um, how that's like, our view is entirely about me paying it forward for what I've been given by others. Um, but I think that's an important message too. Uh, but the most thing, the core of what our view is about is about <coughs> individual discovery and progress. And that's how we get our diversity. That's how between all of us and here we can build awesome stuff that we can all share. And that's the most important thing out of all of this stuff. Now, so far, and I'm not gonna talk about them, but you can go to the website and see them. We've had 22, I think 22 students um, finish the course successfully. And there's 22 new open source projects or decent contribution to open source projects as a result of the last four, three and a half months of sessions, which I think is awesome. So the emergent lesson from doing that sort of work, everyone who comes into RMU needs to work on an individual project. They need to get it accepted, the proposal for it, before they even start their first day. It means that all three of those uh, three weeks that they're there has a particular purpose. They're there with someone who supposedly has some experience in Ruby, and they've got a reason to learn. And all the other exercises are just made to have them have something in common that they can discuss. The real purpose is for them to work on these projects. And the emergent lessons from these are everything that we do in the course, which is just amazing to me. So working on real problems is the secret sauce of RMU. And it's really a lot of fun, but it's a whole lot of work. Now, when I first started this out, I took some donations. I took, I think it was $3,000 or something like that, um, because I thought I was just gonna build some exercises and then just sort of let the course run itself. As it turns out, with my first month of working on this, the time that I put into it didn't go down, but it went up. Um, and at this point, I'm working uh, 40 to 50 hours a week on this, and I've basically completely stopped my consulting work. Um, as of December 1st, I am only doing back maintenance on old projects and I will not do any more consulting work for as long as I can because I care about this project. Um, so why? Why me for one and why free? So seven years ago, I thought it was a great idea to, okay, to make a, make a text adventure game which made it save files 
by writing out global variables to a file in Perl and then evaling them back in. <laughs> and the entire application was one big script that did that. Uh, but yet, today, I literally wrote the book on Ruby best practices, which was translated into Japanese. Uh, it's got a foreword by Matt's, and the tech editor on it in Japan was um, Takahashi. And how the hell does that happen? I mean, I, to this day, am amazed about that. And I have exactly one reason why. And it's James. James worked with me. <laughs> He worked with me since I was 17 years old. When I thought that writing a giant Perl program with nothing but global variables was a great idea. <laughs> I, I was just hacking on this stuff because at the time, my parents were going through a divorce, family life wasn't great, and this is something I could do to get away from it. I never thought it was gonna be a serious thing. But for the last seven years, I've worked towards a path where I could be here today, and it's all because of that man's work. He worked with me every day, talking to me, helping me bit by bit, and that's the spirit I want to promote. Teaching changes lives. The good thing is that now that I'm doing this, I'm not alone at RMU. My students have helped. There's a few of you here, and they've done amazing things. Yeah. <laughs> I have the most supportive wife that I can imagine, and she uh, is an RMU student and also the administrative contact at RMU that does a lot of our uh, miscellaneous work. I also have a friend that's almost as crazy as I am, the guy that I made Pressman with, and I've known him since middle school, and he decided that he really liked this project, and he's a Ruby Rails developer that I've been training. And he built a really cool system for us that we're still working on. So I'd like to have him come up here and show you guys what we've been working on the last couple of minutes we have here. Um, so I'm getting off the stage now, so thank you. Hello, everybody. We've got exactly five minutes, but this is exactly how long I planned on talking. So uh, I'm gonna talk about University Web real quick. It's this big Rails application that we've been slowly building for the past couple of months. And it's what we use so Greg's head doesn't explode when he has to track all of his students. Uh, some of the quick features of the, the app, I'm not gonna go through all of them. We have IRC logs in the app. We have a student directory. All of our exams are tracked in that. We have course registration, the courses themselves, and all the notes, documents, assignments, student submissions, and comments. Those are all in our app. Um, but the thing we're going to focus on today is the assignment submission piece because that's sort of that's the important part. That's what students, you know, how their progress is tracked and how we know if they've become an alumni and all that fun stuff. So before University Web, things were kind of a mess. We were all over the place. Um, all of the code was on GitHub, and then we had mailing lists. And this was in the old design where we had deadlines. So what would happen is a deadline would hit. Greg would go through all the forks on the assignment. He would comment on the mailing list, and then hopefully all the feedback got back to the student and progress would ensue. Uh, it worked, but it really didn't encourage students to collaborate, and it also made it very difficult for Greg to track everything and even for the students to track their work. So we took our first stab at it in app, and we created this thing called a review. And so every time a student wanted a review on a submission, they would create this review, they would comment on it, and then the review would sort of get closed but that didn't mean the submission was done, so we would create it again, and they were all kind of in isolation. Um, so it was nice that it was an app, but it really wasn't the best solution. It was hard to see what other students were working on because they were in these silos. So then we took another stab at it, and our reviews take two, and now we sort of got rid of this idea of the review. We have the submission, there are comments on the submission, and it keeps, keeps going until it's approved. And the other thing that we added was an activity feed so you could see everything that was happening within these submissions. So students were really tied into each other. And now I'm going to pray to the demo gods and hopefully things will work. Uh, this is our, our monolithic uh, login screen. Greg and I spent many hours working on this. All right, here we are. Uh, so this is our dashboard, and I'm going to jump right into this new code enrolled in one course. We're going to take a look at her RubyConf 101. And in here, this is the, the basic uh, 
course view that we have, of course it has the descriptions, all those documents I talked about, notes, and their assignments are on the side here. Um, this is part of our first attempt at making it visible as to what students were doing. You can see my A student, I'm logged in as A student, and you know these are all my assignments and I've submitted some things and I can see where everybody else is, but I don't really know what's happening. And that's when we introduce this activity feed down here. So now I can, every time I log in, I can see the latest things that have been happening in RMU. I can see Greg is making a comment on a student <coughs> submission. And if anything looks interesting, it's like, oh yeah, that sounds like a cool problem. I'm gonna jump right into the student submission here. And now we have sort of a historical view looking at a student submission for this first exercise. And they can, students can update their description, which is nice, all in line, nothing fancy there. Um, and then this is the comment. So you can see how the student starts with, uh, you know, an idea. Greg comes back and says, yeah, that's a good idea. Here's some code and some more ideas. And the student says, oh, that's good. More questions talking about, um, you know, uh, some features he's thinking about. And at this point, Greg's like, oh boy, we gotta, we gotta go live here. So we're gonna go to IRC. And you can see sort of how this, this really helps compared to a mailing list and keeps things sort of sane. <coughs> So I think I would actually under time, which is fine, because I hopefully you guys have questions. Um, if you want to learn more about RMU in general, you have university.rubymanfit.com, and more about University Web, it's up on GitHub. So I'm going to pass it back over to Greg. Thank you. It looks like we have about a minute and 45 seconds for questions. So if anyone has questions. How can we help uh, keep RMU going? Um, well, there's two ways right now. One is to join um, when the entrance exams come out and then become part of the community. Um, the other is, I'm actually, I started a newsletter. Uh, while we're, we're trying to get a nonprofit set up, but until then, I am quickly running out of money. So um, I made a, a newsletter called Practicing Ruby. And what it is, is I take some of the concepts that are coming up that are common with the students say, wow, that means there's probably not documentation about it. So I write up an article about that and then post it. So there's a newsletter, it's $5 a month. Um, you can, I talk about it nonstop on Twitter because I'm excited about it. Uh, so if you follow me there, you'll find it. Um, that's, that's it for right now. Once we get a proper organization set up, there'll be a lot of ways to contribute. Uh, anything else? No, it's not a problem, and the reason why is we do an entrance exam. Um, so people have to get accepted, so they have to put the work in in the first place. Um, and then on top of that, they have to come up with a project proposal, which takes some time. And we do get dropout rate, but as far as I know, like for free online courses, the average dropout rate is like 90%. Um, ours, we have 50% successful completion in only like 10% dropout right overall. Sometimes people say, I'm too busy, I'll come back later. But so far we've done pretty well considering. And uh, in terms of charging for it, um, I absolutely can't. Um, I, I started a thing called uh, Ruby Problems and it was only $3 an article. But someone was wrote to me and said that was basically like in, in their country and, and many other countries, that's like half a day's pay or a day's pay. And I care a lot about making this available to everybody. People have talked about um, doing like a, a scholarship sort of model, which is a possibility way down the line. But for right now, this is what I want to do. And uh, because we're going to produce a ton of open source, we're going to try and find a way to fund it uh, so that that's not a problem. Uh, I think I am now time maybe one more. Um, and you said this is for people who have some basic language fundamentals already, and then they want to keep going and refining it. Mm -hmm. do you, have you thought about expanding sort of downwards to also introduce language fundamentals? Uh, it's definitely something that we're thinking about. We don't have the resources for it right now, but actually, because we don't pass everyone on the entrance exams, uh, the alumni students want to start up like a little one-week program that they run every couple months to give someone some basics so that they can figure out what they need to learn in order to get themselves in time here. And I think uh, now over time, uh, feel free to catch me whenever and talk to me about this. Um, but thank you.